Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to present my work at this workshop. Thank you for the nomination uh, for the Best Paper Award, and thank you, Professor Jung, for inviting me. So my name is Robin Rayamaki. I'm currently a postdoc at the University of California in San Diego. Also have still an affiliation with Alta University, my alma mater, from which I graduated last year. So the topic of my talk will be on sparse sensor arrays and uh, array processing, uh, especially for sensing applications. So I'll be talking about these two papers, uh, nominated papers. The first one uh, will be on design of so-called sparse array configurations. Uh, and the second one will be on imaging uh, using these uh, configurations. So these are both featured in my thesis uh, from last year. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, my co-authors, Professor Visa Koyavunen from Aalto University and Professor Sandeep Chapuri from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. And also uh, the Academy of Finland and Tata Trust for funding this uh, work. So let's start by briefly going over the title. It's a bit of a mouthful. So let's look at what I mean by all these words individually. So by a sensor, I mean some device for either transmitting or receiving or both uh, signals, which then you are used to probe the environment and measure, measure the environment. So for example, antennas and microphones, but for uh, accelerometers are just some, some examples. An array of sensors, then a spatial collection of such uh, devices. And in particular, uh, what I mean by a sensor array is uh, the sensors working phase coherently, meaning that they are synchronized with each other so we can form spatial beams. It's something called beam form, which we'll talk about in a minute. By sparse sensor array, I mean uh, thinned or non-uniformly sampled sensor array depicted here. So we drop out some of the elements uh, from this uniform grid. And the sensing part is really probing and perceiving the environment. So in this example, we transmit a signal, it's backscattered from some target or object. We receive the measurement, uh, we measure the backscattered signal and then do some processing to do these typical tasks of array processing, or for example, detecting the presence or absence of a target or estimating the target parameters, in this case, maybe velocity and bearing, like the direction of arrival, and, uh, or then just imaging the scene, which is, will be concentrating on this imaging part the processing. As I already mentioned, active sensing, uh, that, that was an example of active sensing on the previous slides where we both transmit and receive, not only passively receive signals. Um, so we have control in active sensing over also, also the transmitted signals. Typical examples from the, from the natural world are uh, echolocation used by some animals, such as bats and dolphins. Array configurations, I guess, is quite self-explanatory. Uh, it's different. Uh, arrangement of sensors is called an array configuration. And the signal processing is then uh, making sense of our measurements and also manipulating what we transmit. OK, so now I'll briefly go over some basics of array processing. And then after that, I'll talk a bit about sparse arrays before we get into the main topic of this talk, you know, presenting the two papers. The basic principle underlying a lot of array processing is something called wave interference. You might remember this from your basic physics class. Um, the idea is that when you have uh, a wavefront arriving at your, uh, for example, your receivers, and you linearly combine these signals, when, when the waves uh, impinging on the different sensors are perfectly in phase, you basically get the uh, enhancement of the signal, so-called constructive interference. So the hills and crests of the signal align perfectly and you get a strong signal. Whereas if they're out of phase, they might cancel out right here. And in array processing, actually, the uh, dependence on uh, constructive or destructive interference will be angle, angle dependent or direction dependent. So when you trace out the sensitivity of the array or the array response as a function of, for example, direction, uh, you get something that looks like this, which is uh, kind of interpreted as a 
so-called beam pattern or spatial response of the array. So at the peaks, you get constructive interference, and at the nulls, you get destructive interference. And the same principles apply, of course, also to transmission. So not only can we listen in on certain spatial directions, but we can also transmit in those uh, directions by appropriately phasing or time delaying the, the signals between the sensors. And a key property of arrays is that the resolution or the beam width uh, improves with the so-called aperture or baseline. So that the distance between the, the two, largest distance between any two sensors in the array. Uh, the quarter caution is appropriate here that you cannot just uh, take two sensors and place them in, uh, infinitely far away from each other uh, because uh, then you will also introduce several of these narrow beams and you will have spatial ambiguities. So typically what's done is that these sensors are placed uniformly, uh, but we'll see that that's actually uh, not necessary as long as you have some, uh, at least some minimum separation between a pair of these sensors. So to recap, some of the benefits of arrays are improved signal to noise ratio, uh, uh, the ability to actually steer these beams electronically without having moving parts and flexibly cha changing these beam patterns to, for example, uh, cancel interference or, or transmit in multiple directions simultaneously. And typical applications include radar, both military and civilian, uh, medical ultrasound, uh, ultrasound imaging for pregnancy monitoring is a is a common one. Uh, wireless communications, uh, not only at the base stations, might you have many antennas, but actually also uh, increasingly so in, in the user devices themselves. More familiar examples from maybe conference rooms or uh, these loudspeakers that you might have at home, and you might have microphone arrays to, to selectively enhance the speech of the, of the speaker or hone in on the speaker. And in radio astronomy, you see these pictures taken by big radio telescopes somewhere in the desert uh, using radio frequencies, typically. And there are many exciting emerging applications which we're uh, working on also, including autonomous sensing and automotive radar, as well as future wireless systems which integrate sensing and communications more tightly together. All right, so now we are ready to discuss a bit more in detail about sparse arrays and why they are uh, used or considered. Um, the basic problem of uh, uniform arrays uh, is, especially when you want to build a large array for improving resolution, uh, you will need many sensors. And not only the sensors may, may be costly, but also the hardware that goes behind each sensor. So you have so-called uh, RFIF front ends or RF chains, which include expensive RF components, uh, power amplifiers, uh, digital to analog or di analog to digital converters, and reducing the number of these components uh, might be necessary or critical to keep the cost and power consumption or computational cost down. So in, instead of building these large uniform arrays, uh, one solution would be to sparsify the array. And indeed, what I claim here is that you can go from order of n sensors to square root of n sensors without incurring uh, significant performance loss. Uh, in the next slide, I'll talk about that in more detail about what I mean by performance loss, but just to see the huge, di huge uh, um, uh, difference between these two scaling laws, you can consider instead of having hundreds or thousands of sensors, you would only need some tens. And this, this distance, of course, grows uh, with increasing number of sensors. So what do I mean by uh, achieving the same performance? Well, for same uh, aperture, you can basically achieve the same resolution and identify as many targets or signal sources as a uniform array, but it, using much fewer physical sensors and hence reduced uh, costs. On the other hand, for the same number of sensors, you could build a larger 
larger physical area, larger aperture, achieve a larger aperture, and hence improve resolution and the number of identifiable sources or targets. So, whereas a uniform array would uh, could only identify up to n n targets using n sensors, a sparse array could do up to n squared targets using n sensors due to a larger aperture. And in between these two extremes, you can then basically do more using less. So yeah, improve performance using fewer uh, resources compared to the uniform array. Another interesting benefit of sparse arrays would, could relate to systems where you have a limited payload carrying capacity. So UAVs, for example, some of the airborne applications where the actual weight of the array uh, is critical as well. The idea, uh, basic idea why uh, you can do uh, better using sparse arrays is that in many applications, what matters is not really the sensor configuration itself, but actually the so-called virtual sensor configuration, which consists, and this virtual array then consists of the, typically the pairwise sums or differences of the physical sensor positions. Uh, the idea, idea is that with n numbers, uh, you can represent uh, up to n squared sums or differences, and the same idea applies here. Hmm. We'll have a look next at how actually these sum and different so-called sum and difference sets arise. Uh, by the way, they've been studied it, uh, for a long time in uh, number theory additive combinatorics. They study these objects every day, and this is a, a great application of of, of these so-called sum and difference sets, and especially extremal sum and differences. So, uh, kind of try to get achieve the maximum sum or difference set size using uh, the fewest. Uh, numbers or fewer sensors in this case. Let's consider briefly the passive, uh, so-called passive sensing uh, signal model. This is a canonical signal model used in area processing, where we have a collection of n sensors and capital K uh, far field point sources. And so source signals are done by here, A by SK. And uh, these uh, source signals impinge on the array from different directions and because they're far away we basically observe uh, plane waves at the sensors some phase shift between each sensor and this can be written as a linear model as follows where we observe a superposition of the source signals uh, basically multiplied by the array so-called array steering vector or array response vector is a function of the angle of arrival and this is n dimensional vector uh, describing the phase and amplitude response of each sensor in the array. Then we have additive noise. And what's typically done is you compute the spatial covariance matrix. And if you look at the uh, vectorized version of this spatial covariance matrix, it's also a linear model in the, but now in the, the source powers, and so nonlinear still in the directions. But uh, if you just compare this row to this row, you'll see that the effective uh, steering vector is now actually the Kronecker product of the physical area steering vector with its uh, complex conjugate, plus some new such stuff here. And the key point is that an element of this uh, effective steering vector will be parameterized by the sensor, pairwise sensor position differences instead of the sensor positions themselves. So a typical assumption is that we have ideal sensors, which are just this uh, complex exponentials depending on the directions and the sensor positions. Uh, if you then look at the element of this vector, actually the, it will be supported on the pairwise sensor position differences. So this uh, shows you how this different set of different co-arrays, it's called in the jargon, emerges. Same similar thing happens in active sensing where we have also control over the transmission. Uh, it's, uh, but here instead, Instead of the difference set, we have the sum set consisting of the pairwise sums of the transmit received pairs. Uh, just by the way, here we don't need to compute second order statistics to actually realize this, this sort of sum set or sum core, right? So now we're in position to actually address the two papers of interest and uh, go over the research problems, the kind of questions we ask and uh, uh, what our contribution was. 
let's remind us ourselves of the setup. We have a active array, so transmit receive array, where both all elements function as both transmitters and receivers uh, in a sequential manner. Uh, we transmit something, uh, we can receive some backscatters from a so-called scattering scene. And from these measurements, we then try to form an image of our scattering scene. So the first paper will be uh, concerning the design of these array configurations, and in particular, we want to design uh, array configurations which achieve the sort of low redundancy, so have as few sensors as possible while achieving a uniform virtual array. But also, we want to be able to scale these to any number of sensors or any apertures. The second part will then consider the actual processing side and forming these images. So how can we use these sparse arrays then to uh, form nice images and especially overcome the so-called spatial aliasing uh, due to the spatial undersampling because we're removing uh, sensors here. The first paper, uh, yeah, as I mentioned this year, uh, we'll be talking about that next. And, and the key property actually, as it'll turn out later, uh, will show that uh, the symmetry of these arrays allows us to achieve uh, equivalent sum and difference sets, which make these arrays uh, useful for both passive and active sensing. Whereas a lot of the conventional configurations are not symmetrical and hence uh, typically only designed for a contiguous or uniform difference core, right? Which means they're mostly useful for passive sensing. The design, every design problem we'd uh, ideally like to solve is an inverse problem where we start from the virtual array and then let's say we want a uniform virtual array. Why uniform? Well, uh, uniform arrays have many nice properties. One being, uh, or the maybe the most important one being that we can avoid ambiguities in kind of identifying source configurations or scattered configurations. So uh, we, we won't confuse as long as the number of targets uh, is less than uh, some quantity or less than basically a proportional to the number of elements in this virtual array. Uh, no matter how they are located, uh, we can still in principle identify uh, and distinguish different uh, uh, target directions from each other. Whereas if it were sparse, then we might end up with some ambiguities. So this is called so-called so -called uniform recovery guarantees, which you can establish with these uniform arrays. Also, there are computational reasons such as uh, certain algorithms uh, are, are you know, kind of leverage this, this uh, shift in variance structure uh, uniformity uh, of the array. But the problem in array design is to, starting from this uniform virtual array, you would like to find out what were uh, the physical array configurations uh, giving rise to it. So starting from the sum or difference set, what is the physical uh, set whose some pairwise sums or differences give rise to this. This is not only an inverse problem, but it's also a combinatorial one because we assume these sensors lie on some grid. And the solution is called the minimum redundancy array in the jargon of, of array processing. And the problem is, of course, it's a very difficult problem to solve. To get some idea of, uh, more idea of, of the difficulty of this problem, you can consider a simple analogy, more familiar to people. So the so-called sparse ruler analogy, which asks uh, which markers in a ruler would you need to retain and how many of them would you need to retain to be able to measure each distance between uh, basically zero and the length of the ruler, the integer distance. And in this simple example, you don't need marker number two because you can measure distance two between one and three. And then in general, for an L marker ruler, you only need square root of L. Uh, markers, but where actually, which markers you should retain and exactly how many uh, markers you need, uh, that's a difficult computational problem. And in the end, you would need to do some kind of exhaustive search to, to figure that out. That's why these optimal rulers are only known up to a certain point, quite moderate numbers of L and N. Uh, and beyond this, we would have to resort to some possibly suboptimal uh, rulers or array configurations, such as this so-called nested nested ruler or nested array here, which uh, indeed you can verify 
measures each can measure each distance between uh, zero and and integer distance between zero and the aperture of the array. So this first part actually nicely nests into these gaps here. That's why it's called a nested array. And these have these kind of rulers or constructions achieve order-wise optimal scaling, and you can generate them from any size, any size ruler or array. Uh, but what's actually missing in, in a lot of the literature is what about rulers for measuring sums, quote unquote. Uh, so actually constructing constructing these efficient uh, samplers for for some sets is relatively less ex explored, and this is what we hope to address. Uh, in this contribution. So what we did was not only we computed some of these optimal configurations, which were previously unknown, uh, but we also constructed um, these scalable and order-wise optimal configurations for not only for the linear case or 1D case, but also for uh, everything in between that and, and the square case, so the different aspect ratios. So these, these arrays achieve Otherwise, of more scaling, so they uh, use square root of n sensors uh, in, in comparison to a, a uniform array of equivalent size with n sensors, and they can be generated for any any number of sensors or any aperture, any aspect ratios, in principle, or in practice, in, indeed, uh, because they have closed form expressions. And the nice thing uh, here is that we can bound also the possible suboptimality of these configurations. So in particular, in the case of the linear array, we uh, can show using uh, actually well-known uh, bounds from, from the additive combinatorics literature that uh, these constructions have at most some tens of percent more sensors uh, than the optimal solution, at least when the number of sensors or size of the array grows to infinity. Uh, here uh, plotted the number of extra sensors or percentage of extra sensors compared to the optimal solution for uh, some final cases where actually the optimal solution is known um, for different aspect ratios. So aspect ratio is the just the ratio of the side lengths of the array. So in one extreme you have a linear 1D array, in another extreme you have a square array. And in this final case you see also it's some some tens of percent, but actually when when uh, the side length goes towards infinity. Uh, this will be uh, bounded below about 30%. And by construction, these arrays have a uniform virtual array, both uh, difference and sum virtual array, um, which makes them uh, amenable to both uh, or usable in both passive and active sensing. And this is actually due to symmetry of the array. So you see these uh, arrays are symmetric. Uh, and indeed, you can convince yourself that if you have a symmetrical array, which just means mathematically this, you know, um, that the sensor, set of sensor positions uh, equals the, the negation of the, of the same set plus uh, this is the maximum element in the, in the set. So for, for simplicity, consider a 1D array where this uh, maximum uh, is uniquely defined. Then just by plugging in this definition in, in, in the sum of some set, you, you really sum set equals the diff difference set up to, some, up to a shift. And how this can be exploited in array design is that indeed, uh, since many of these uh, uh, array configurations with the, con with the uniform difference set are known, uh, these uh, Configurations can be symmetrized to produce uh, an array with uh, uniform sum and difference. In this example, you see the nested array, which is asymmetrical. It has a uniform difference set, difference co-array, but uh, some co-array actually has some holes here, which is then fixed by symmetrizing the array and optimizing these array parameters. Uh, the price you have to pay in this case is you have to use a, a couple extra sensors. So instead of eight sensors, you now have 10 sensors. But even in the case when you fix the number of sensors, uh, you might still uh, achieve some advantage by symmetrizing. So in particular here, although the asymmetrical nested array has 
a larger difference set because it's a, it's a larger uh, physical aperture, the sum, uniform sum set is still a larger for the symmetrical array. A uh, nice property also of these symmetrical arrays is that uh, you achieve the maximum number of virtual sensors for a given physical aperture, which may be uh, useful in, in applications where you only have a limited area for placing placing the sensors, such as, for example, in automotive uh, applications, where you cannot just realize an uh, arbitrarily large uh, aperture or ba physical aperture or baseline. So to recap, uh, we saw that the optimal, kind of the optimal array configuration is challenging, and therefore people resort to these order-wise optimal and scalable configurations, which typically can be described in closed form or computed in polynomial time. We presented some of these uh, which achieve both the uniform sum and difference set uh, because of the symmetry of the array. Moving on to the next uh, paper, uh, this is now an application or not only application of these uh, derived configurations, but actually developing the methods for uh, imaging using them. I'll be concentrating less on this hybrid beamforming aspect. I'll briefly mention it in the end of the talk, uh, but for now you don't have to mind uh, what hybrid beamforming is, but actually just considering this sparse uh, array imaging or sensing problem. So what do I mean by array imaging? So in the case of an active array, what it means is we form a transmit and receive beam in a certain direction and, and then and fill in out some pixels in our image, and then we re-steer our transmit and receive beams and fill out more pixels in the image, and so on and so forth, until we kind of form the whole image. That's what I mean by array imaging. The problem with using sparse arrays uh, is that the beam beams that you form might be uh, of lower quality uh, for a uniform array. They might not be nicely uh, directed and pencil shaped. Uh, and this is basically uh, will result in your image to be of maybe unsatisfactory or poor quality. Uh, this is indeed due to so-called spatial aliasing, where you create these so-called grating lobes. So instead of having the one nice uh, beam, you have several, uh, and you cannot really suppress these large side lobes uh, in, a, in a single single transmission necessarily. So what is done is uh, one way to overcome this is to actually take several images using different beam patterns first, and then sum these images together. And these images are kind of complex values. So then you get constructive and destructive interference. So the synthesized image can actually be uh, produced, which is comparable or actually identical to the one taken by the uniform array. The problem with this approach is that, of course, you, if you need to transmit several times, the, the reconstruction of the image might take longer. And this is the problem we address then, how to uh, minimize the time needed to, to form these synthetic images using image addition. And indeed, we develop a method for optimizing the beam patterns at each transmission reception cycle to, uh, first of all, improve uh, the image quality and, and achieve a desired uh, image quality and do that faster. So how do we do that? Well, to understand this, we need to uh, first go take a step back and understand that the uh, key quantity or key, key object that uh, we need to analyze is the so-called effective transmit received beam pattern of the system. And this is the product of the transmit and receive beam patterns. And what image addition does is um, adds together several of these effective beam patterns in a way that the synthesized final effective beam pattern has a desired uh, form. And there's a Fourier transform relationship between the beam patterns and the physical uh, element weights of the transmitter and receiver. Uh, and these weights, uh, just to depict the, the phase and amplitude shifts we apply to the transmitted or received signals after 
them being linearly combined or before them being linearly combined. So uh, just to show you, so these physical uh, weights and the beam patterns are, are Fourier transform pairs. So you have a actually multiplication of the beam patterns mean, means a convolution of the, the beam forming weights. In the case of uniform array, uh, we have this natural way of the kind of triangular window of the virtual array. Uh, in this case of sparse array, it's something different, but most importantly, the support of these two virtual array weight, uh, weights are the same. And this is by design of the array configuration. So we designed the, the sparse array to have a uniform virtual array. But now accessing or changing these values in the sparse array case is more challenging because we have fewer uh, degrees of freedom here to, to select the weights in the physical array domain. And hence, one convolution with one convolution, you might not be able to realize an arbitrary beam pattern. And hence, the set of beam patterns is also more limited in the sparse array case. So, what is uh, what image addition does is instead of using one convolution, you sum together several. Uh, that's seen here. If we went, want to do, form this uh, virtual array weighting or corresponding to some beam pattern, then uh, we can actually take two different. Uh, transmit receive uh, weight convolutions and sum them together, uh, which would correspond to summing together these two uh, beam pattern products uh, to synthesize this uh, virtual array weighting of beam pattern. With the uniform array, you can do it with one convolution, but how to, to, how to select these weights, uh, it's not an arbitrary problem. I uh, still have to do some computation to figure it out. I'll briefly mention how you can solve, solve uh, these physical array weights. So this is again an inverse problem starting from the right. You would like to figure out what's uh, the convolution uh, terms on, on the left hand side. So the way we do this, uh, the way we first of all solve for these beam forming weights and minimize the number of component images that are needed. Uh, the key quantity is this weight matrix, which is just out of the product of the transmit and receive uh, physical uh, array weights or beam forming weights. This is a rank Q matrix where Q now represents the number of component images and we would like to minimize Q. So this becomes a, a rank minimization problem. It's a non-convex problem, uh, but, uh, and here, by the way, the, the constraint is some fidelity constraint on the desired beam pattern or virtual array, array weights. So why would it be the desired beam pattern or uh, desired virtual array weights, and it would be a, a response matrix of, of the array. And we'd like to achieve that to some accuracy epsilon. So you can solve this approximately using standard convex relaxation techniques. So relaxing the rank to the convex surrogate uh, nuclear norm, for example. Or then you could uh, apply a non convex method uh, such as alternative minimization, where you write W as a product of two matrices with a rank revealing structure. So the inner dimensions of this matrix product will denote the rank, and then you can uh, bisect over the rank to find the smallest rank such that this constraint is uh, satisfied. Alternatively, updating the two terms. I won't be talking about uh, these algorithms in more detail. What I want to focus now on is how does the rank the solution of this problem scale when we set epsilon equal to zero. So when we want to satisfy this equation uh, exactly, we want to do exactly uh, uh, synthesize a uh, given feasible beam pattern. Uh, so how does the rank RSQ Q scale for different array configurations, in particular sparse and uniform arrays? Our result is as follows that intuitively what it says is that the fewer physical sensors you have, the more component images you would need uh, to achieve certain, uh, or to achieve actually any uh, feasible beam pattern. So the set of feasible beam patterns uh, of the uniform and sparse array is the same, uh, as long as they have the same virtual array. But for a sparse array, instead of, uh, if you have n sensors in the uniform array and a square root of n sensor in the sparse array, you would need at most order of uh, square root of n in component images for 
uh, in the sparse rate to actually achieve, or you would need a order of square root of n component images to achieve any beam pattern achievable by the uniform array. Of course, there are some certain beam patterns which you can achieve, uh, achieve with only uh, with much fewer component images in the sparse array case, but to achieve any beam pattern, this, this is the number of component images you would need. The way this is derived is in by upper and lower bound in Q. The lower bound is obtained by just a simple counting of the number of equations versus unknowns in this uh, equation. So the number of unknowns uh, of free variables is essentially dictated by this rank Q n by n matrix W. Uh, so we have this many free variables and then the number of equations is essentially uh, equal to the number of virtual array sensors. And you note that here by n sigma. And we get a second order uh, uh, inequality, which can be then solved for Q. And if you insert the values for this number of virtual sensors for the uniform array and the sparse array, we get the, that Q is lower bounded by one in the case of the uniform array and lower bounded by some constant times n in the case of the sparse array. Here, word of caution, I am assuming now that the number of sensors in the uniform array and sparse array is n. So we get the lower bound uh, and the upper bound similarly matches the lower bound. Uh, the way that we achieve a uh, upper bound is to consider explicit weighting schemes. So, or sensor selection schemes such that we can uh, control the weights of the virtual array individually. So each element of the virtual array individually. Here's the procedure depicted in the case of the uniform array. So first we would transmit from one sensor and use all the sensor for reception. Uh, that way we can influence these four uh, virtual array sensors here or the weights of these four sensors here. And the next stage we would transmit from another sensor and then use the subset of the receivers to uh, control the weights of the remaining sensors. And a similar approach can be uh, shown to hold for certain sparse arrays. So the result is actually in this case you need at most two component images to re realize any virtual array waiting for the uniform array. And in the case of sparse arrays, you can show that there exist sparse arrays which achieve this order of n scaling. So then the upper and lower bounds match order wise, and we have q proportional to uh, or order of one for the uniform array and q proportional to n in the case of the sparse array. Uh, by the way, uh, here I showed the examples for 1D arrays, but uh, the same principles hold for 2Ds and the same scaling laws, actually. To summarize, uh, we looked at, uh, basically, we were comparing uniform and sparse arrays for, uh, first of all, the same number of sensors. And in this case, sparse arrays can achieve larger aperture and hence better resolution at the, an expense of possibly having to uh, transmit and receive several time, more times, uh, in, in this case, up to n times if the number of sensors is n, n in these arrays. In the case of uh, uh, same aperture, we can reduce the number of sensors drastically from order of n to square root of n. Still, we might need to uh, uh, use order of square root of n component images to achieve any uh, kind of image quality, uh, as in the uniform case. And, and another caveat is uh, we have fewer sensors, so we might lose a signal to noise ratio, uh, especially at the receiver side. So there's no free lunch, unfortunately. To recap, uh, what we learned is that the, some of the artifacts caused by spatial aliasing uh, in the sparse arrays can be compensated for by this technique called image addition, where we sum together several illuminations of the target scene uh, by choosing our beam patterns uh, judiciously. Uh, and we can minimize, and then what we did was we minimized the number of uh, transmissions needed by properly designing these beam patterns. Um, and uh, the main scaling law that we showed is that fewer physical sensors uh, implies more component images if you want to achieve uh, any beam pattern as the, as the uniform array of equivalent aperture. 
to finish off, I'll just uh, briefly mention two extensions to the preceding framework. So the first one is hybrid beamforming, which was also included in the title of the second paper. A hybrid beamforming uh, essentially is a, a beamforming, inexpensive beamforming architecture used in uh, many high frequency systems, uh, such as like millimeter wave and beyond communications and sensing systems, where uh, you might not be able to afford to have a dedicated front end for each uh, antenna as in a fully digital implementation, but instead you have fewer front ends than antennas. Uh, in the extreme case, you only have one, in which case this architecture is called analog beamformer. And uh, you then compensate for this loss of or fewer uh, front ends by also introducing these phase shifters. Uh, so these are components that control the phase uh, in ingoing or out coming from the antennas. They can control the amplitude, but they're very inexpensive components. Uh, and they introduce some additional system constraints, which are mathematically quite uh, challenging and interesting to, to handle. But the point is that we can show uh, that these beamforming architectures don't, do not uh, essentially impact the scaling laws we just discussed. So for the uniform and sparse array, especially we have the same scaling laws. In the case, the, the phase quantization of these phase shifters is infinite. Another interesting uh, extension is uh, instead of transmitting just one waveform, as we implicitly assumed throughout this presentation, um, so we assumed that we could we basically uh, phase shift uh, and amplify this one single waveform from each sensor. Uh, instead, we could transmit multiple linearly independent waveforms, as many as the number of front ends we have at the transmitter, and uh, then actually. Uh, at the receiver, you can uh, kind of decouple these different waveforms to achieve uh, or, or realize more uh, uh, effectively more uh, measurements per transmission, and you can reduce the number of transmissions or component images uh, uh, needed yeah, proportionally. All right, so that was it. I hope you. Uh, learned something. I hope you got inspired. Um, as I said, any of the uh, underlying mathematical ideas of the sparse arrays are, have a deep roots in, in number theory and additive combinatorics. And there are many other applications of these sum and difference sets, including uh, coding theory and uh, uh, sequence design with good autocorrelation properties, uh, for example. So. Uh, yeah, I hope you find, found it useful and interesting. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them online uh, on Slack or then uh, offline on uh, per email. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude and thank you and hope to see you soon again.